We're ready. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me. This is our first ever webinar with Terry Cooper, the RV, Te Texas RV professor. Uh, if there's any questions, go ahead and ask now. I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoy. Go ahead, Terry. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Folks, you, you really have to understand, he was telling you the truth. This is the first webinar he's ever done. So, hey, you know, we'll have to pr applaud him and say, hey, thank you very much. Uh, let's just kind of do some housekeeping real quick, and then we'll get started. If you'll notice, there is a question box, a little box that you can type in questions and so on, and there will be a question answering session towards the end. Uh, what we find is is that because we have all different types of equipment, it just seems to be that if we open up the mic for live, there's usually so much feedback and all kinds of issues. So what we found that works the best, and we seem to not pierce everybody's eardrums, is to uh, give you a chance to ask questions. So Lady E, who happens to be my wife, uh, she also has her little website called uh, My RV Kitchen. So if you get a chance to go by there, she has her Centennial RV Cookbook. And uh, she and Ed will be monitoring the questions and seeing what's going on. So that way, some of the questions they can answer directly, but some that they'll be kind of compiling and putting them together. We will try to answer all that we can in the allotted amount of time. Uh, our goal is to go approximately one hour. Uh, I will say, and I do have a, I do have approval from Ed that if there's a lot of questions come in, we'll try to respond to as many as we can. You know, we don't want to drag this into a marathon, but we, if we go over that hour, well, that's just the way we'll we'll try to work with. So, with that being said, um, let me just kind of give you a little background of what's happened here. We were sitting in, uh, uh, I guess it was Forest in City. Iowa. yeah, Forest City, Iowa. There, well, at Vega, weren't we? And we were talking about. Uh -huh how big the RV tips group had gotten. And I began to kind of start watching you folks. And what's really interesting is that I'm seeing such a wide variety of individuals. Some of you know a lot about the RVing experience. Some of you have a pretty good feel of it. And some of you are relatively new to this. So Ed and I were talking about this. And we were saying, well, what's the biggest thing that people seem to be struggling with? And it's electrical. So which is pretty standard in our, in our business. Uh, most of us are afraid of electrical. We have this think this is big old mysterious thing. So that's what we're going to cover this afternoon. I want to make sure that we lay some groundwork. Uh, depending on how things go, if there is the request for it coming in from you guys, we were going to be doing a six-part series of the Take Home Technician series. We do this quite a bit with dealerships, um, other campgrounds, and so on, to kind of help them keep their clients up to speed. Basically, Mobile RV Academy is a school that travels. We live full-time in an RV. We have a fifth wheel. In fact, you'll see some pictures of it here in a little bit. And we travel. I used to be an, a college educator in Waco, Texas, teaching at a technical school where I trained RV technicians. So what you're getting is a lot of the material that a lot of those students that were attending my classes got. So with that being said, let's get started here. We've got some things that I want to make sure that we cover tonight. The big question is, what's a purple monkey? Folks, a purple monkey is that little thing, that little voice that we hear that chirps in our ear, stands there on our shoulders and talks to us when there's a problem and says, oh, this is bad. This is really bad. Oh, man, we're, we've got reservations. We're going to lose money. How much is this going to cost? You know, all these different things going on. This little thing is just screeching in our ear. Some people call it self-talk. I call it a purple monkey. Because what we've got to do is we have to train ourselves to step back and realize that that purple monkey is nothing more than that little voice of fear. And what we want to do is I want to spend some time with you today walking you through ways and things that you can do uh, to take that fear away. Because I'm going to tell you what I have found over and over again, and this stands true. 80% of the problems that you're going to have with your RV are going to be easy to fix and easy to access. So these are things that you and I can do. Now, I, I know that some of you folks that are in the group are technicians. Maybe you run a mobile service, so I'm not pinging on you guys. Some of you work for dealership. I'm not pinging on you. You guys are so busy. I mean, sometimes it's all you can do to get out to see the customers that you had call in in the last two days, and you've got the long list after that. So if we can learn how to do things, how we can take care of our own problems, resetting circuit breakers, repairing water leaks, you know, sealing roof leaks, and things like that, these are easy to access and easy to fix. 
And let's save that other 20% for when we really are backed up against the wall and it's out of our league. I mean, there's some things that I turn over to somebody else and let them do. But for the most part, I do all my own work. Some of it is I don't have the shop. Some of it I don't have the time. But nevertheless, 80% of these things we can do ourselves. Okay? Now, I'd be amiss if I didn't share with you who's bringing this. You know, somebody's always got to pick up the tab for us to do something. Because if we go out to dinner with somebody, someone's got to pick up the tab, right? Well, we've had some folks that have been gracious enough to sponsor us and, and say, hey, you know what? I'm on board. I want to make sure that people know that there's things that they can do to take care of their life. And Steve Anderson with Work Camper News. And, of course, Lady E and I with Mobile RV Academy. There's also a group called the RV Inspection Connection. If you're not familiar with home inspections for an RV, there's now an organization that does that. And we've been doing this for about three years. And then those of you that have come along or those of you that want to go further in this RV lifestyle might want to take a look at this National RV Inspectors Association. There might be something there that help you earn some dollars on the road. Okay? So let's jump in. Whether you realize it or not, there are three separate electrical systems in every RV. It doesn't matter if it's a pop-up camper or if it's a big old motorhome. They have at least three electrical systems. And this is how they're broken down. In the chassis voltage, now we say starter lights and ignition. What that means is this is the turn signals. This is the, you know, where you put the key in the ignition, you turn on the, the dash, you start that starter. That is that voltage we're talking about, that 12 volts. And we're used to that. I mean, I mean, let's face it, we've been driving cars probably since we were 13, 14, 15 years old. And so we know, well, we may not know how it works, but we know there's a battery underneath the hood and it runs things. And then we have that voltage in our RV that some people call it the house voltage or the 120 volt voltage, just you know, kind of like what we've got in a brick and stick house. And in our RV, it's going to run air conditioners and maybe the heating element, the water heater, and the television, and the microwave, and some of the house, other house type appliances, coffee pots, ceiling fans, things like that. If you've got wall receptacles, you know, that's the 120 volts, just like in our brick and stick home. And then we have the other 12 volts. Now this is the one that's the deep cycle battery. That battery is a little different than that chassis voltage. It's a totally different battery. Uh, some people call it the house voltage, house battery. So depending on what part of the country you live in, there's maybe some things that people call it differently. In the RV, in today's world, most of the appliances or most of the things that we're operating, like the ceiling lights, you know, the LED lights, the water pump, uh, you know, the awnings, if you push a button and the awning turns on, or if you've got a thermostat that hangs on the wall for the air conditioner and the furnace, that control board that talks to that thermostat, talks to that air conditioner, talks to that furnace, is a 12-volt device. Just like the circuit board on that refrigerator, if you have an RV style refrigerator, that refrigerator has a 12 volt circuit board. Uh, your slide outs, your leveling systems. So if you lose that deep cycle battery, if you lose your 12 volts house voltage, you're dead in the water. Things don't work. Stereo systems can start going dim. You know, I, I was watching the other day, somebody typed in and said, you know, I couldn't understand why their stereo was getting fainter and fainter what it was. They had a 12 volt stereo system and it was being powered by a battery that was going down. And then, so let's take a look at it. Now let's go back. What I have found is, is that many times we've got to say things three times before we remember it. So let's go back over it. This is number two. Now chassis voltage, now this is for towables. Now an RV can either be a towable, which we pull behind another vehicle, or it's going to be a motorized, which is going to be self-propelled, like you know the motorhome class A's, B's, and C's. And we'll look at those a little bit, but let's take a look at the towable. The chassis voltage is the tail lights, the marker lights, you know, the lights up at the top, the brake lights. So when you in the cab of the truck or the suburban or whatever you're pulling that vehicle with, you tap those brakes on your vehicle, it turns on the brake lights. But it also sends a voltage back through a device inside your vehicle called a brake controller. And that 12 volts is applied to those electric wheel brakes to shut that thing down. Now, if you've got hydraulic brakes on your vehicle, 
which some of you guys do, there is a unit there that actually takes that 12 volts and powers a pump to pressurize that hydraulic line to shut down those hydraulic brakes on that trailer. Okay, so when we say electric wheel brakes, that's what we're talking about, that brake controller coming from the tow vehicle going to the rig. Now, what you're looking at right here is a seven pin connector. Depending on what part of the country you're from, they might, might call it the pigtail. Now, this is what we plug in from the RV into the towing vehicle, the pickup, the Suburban, uh, you know, whatever it is that you're pulling with. Now, the reason why I have this this photo here. I want you to look at it. Notice the corrosion that's on some of the pins. So what happens is, is when we go to plug this thing in to the receiver, the seven pin connector receiver, the female end of it, end that's in our vehicle, if we've got this kind of corrosion on it, guess what's not working? Depending on which one it is, it might be a left turn signal, maybe a brake light or whatever. So the point being is, is when you disconnect that shore power, when you disconnect that uh, power cord, that pigtail for lack of a better term, be sure and hang it up out of the way so the water doesn't get on it because that's what happened here. I came across this unit and was laying down in a, in a water puddle on a parking lot. Pulled it up and this is what it looked like. Now, you don't think anything about it, but when you and I get ready to hook up, we're ready to go and all of a sudden some of our lights aren't working. We gotta get out here and figure out what's going on. Scrape it, clean that brass connection. We shouldn't have to do that. If we do a little bit of take care of it, we won't have to worry about this. Now let's look at the chassis voltage on the motorized. Now we know what a class A motorhome is, right? It's, it's basically they drove a frame into the factory and basically all they had was a frame and engine transmission. Some guy probably sat on a, a bucket or an apple crate or something and drove it into the factory line and they built a box over all over all of that frame. And that's typically the best way to remember a Class A, is they built the box over all of the frame. Now, a Class B is a van. Um, I hear people call them the Scooby-Doo vans or the Good Time vans. You know, those are names that it kind of dates you when you use those terms. Because uh, I remember when I was growing up, I wanted a Good Time van so bad. And my father looked at me like, son, there's not a father in town that's going to let you take their daughter out in a Good Time van. That's not going to happen. So, you know, at 18 years old, what do you know, right? But basically a Class B is a tricked out van. Now we're seeing some that are coming in that are coming in from Europe, the Sprinter vans uh, that have that five-cylinder Mercedes engine and some of those. So we're really beginning to see this thing take off. And one of the big companies we see with the Class Bs is the Road Trek. You know, that's one brand. There's others, but what you see is they've taken this van, they really beef it up, and basically you've got all of the appliances. You may have a bathroom in here. You may have a shower. So it's a cramped, but it's got everything you need. A Class C, basically what they did is they took a cab and chassis, in other words, they took a, a one-ton truck or bigger and whacked it off behind the driver's seat and built a box over the, and you notice how typically Class Cs hang over the cab. Now, when we talk about the chassis voltage for these three different classes, it's going to be the turn signals, it's going to be the brake lights, it's going to be the marker lights, it's going to be the starter, but it's also going to be the dash accessories. You know, the gauges on the dash, the turn on the blower motor, all of those things, just like we have in our regular automobiles. So, when you look at towable versus motorized, when we say that the chassis voltage, it's just that. It only operates the chassis items, okay? Now, let's take a look at the other two. And I got to thinking about this this afternoon. I thought, now, how do we talk about this? How do we share with everyone how these are separate, but yet they are tied together in a small way? Now, if you notice over here in the bottom left-hand corner of this page, what we've got here is, is, is one of two power cords. We either have that three-prong 30-amp power cord that has 120 volts, 30 amps, or we have that four-prong 40, I'm sorry, four-prong 50-amp power cord that brings in 240 volts. And people say, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are no 240 volt appliances in the RV. That's right. Because what they're doing is that we're plugging into a pedestal 
at the campground or firing your generator and it's putting out 220 240 volts but what we do is when we get it into the circuit breaker panel blocks we split it apart and I'll show you here in just a minute what it looks like but they have what they call two separate legs leg one is typically a black wire leg two is going to be a red wire and each one of those wires is going to carry 120 volts now 120 volts plus 120 volts gives you 240 so when you begin to look at these power cords I'm going to show you here in just a few moments that the difference between a 30 amp power cord and a so-called 50 amp power cord is going to be the voltage but certainly the amount of amperage now I know I'm using terms that you're saying okay Cooper I don't understand just bear with me I'm gonna take you through here in just a few moments we're gonna talk about voltage we're gonna talk about amperage we're gonna talk about resistance and that other term called wattage okay now power comes in from the pedestal or from the generator or from what they call an inverter a device that pulls power out of the batteries and makes 120 volts for us and we bring it into the circuit breaker panel box. That panel box is just like the one in your brick and stick home. Okay, and from there we have circuit breakers that run off to the wall outlets and some lights and maybe the appliances like the air conditioner and the microwave and maybe the electric heating element for the water heater or maybe the 120 volt heating element for the refrigerator. All of those things are being taken care of by the circuit breaker panel box. But there's also another device, and in this diagram it's just to the right of the breaker panel box, and it's called a converter. Now a converter is basically, for lack of better terms, is a fancy battery charger. Now this battery charger, what it's doing is it's going to take 120 volts from the panel box, and it's going to convert and make 12 volts battery voltage for us. Now we're going to bring it to the fuse panel. Because what's going to happen is this converter is going to make us 12 volts to feed the LED lights and the water pump and some of the fans in the bathroom or different things like that. And then also power up the circuit boards. Remember those circuit boards are on the appliances? So whether it's an air conditioner, a furnace, a refrigerator, or even the water heater, circuit boards are on there and they are all 12 volt controlled. Now what happens though is, is that let's say that we decide we're going to bring in or take or take out the slides or we're going to level with our leveling legs because that hydraulic pump that our electric screw motors or whatever's running those devices those slide outs whatever it is pulls so much power it's more than what the converter can provide for us so what we do is we draw on a reserve we draw on a piggy bank that we call the deep cycle battery and so what we're doing is, is that we're, we're depending on the converter to give us what we need just to kind of keep us going. But if we need extra, we pull it from the battery. And so then at night when we're sleeping and everything's kind of quiet in the house, nothing's going on, that converter then starts charging up that battery to get it ready again when we get, when we get ready to need it the next day. Now, this is a... AC circuit panel box, AC voltage. Now you can, some of you will have one that looks like this, some of you will have a big tall one that stands up, but what I want you to notice is the circuit breakers that are in here. And so what you're looking at is a panel box that looks just like the panel box in your brick and stick home. Now there are some minor differences inside that panel box and we could go into quite a bit of detail on that. And we do that in some classes that we have. But I don't want to bore you with the details of where each wire goes. I just need you to understand, in many of these circuit breaker panel boxes, you can see the black circuit breakers. And then if you'll notice on the right-hand side, we have 12-volt fuses. So this particular panel box is what we call a combination box. In it, we have the 120-volt circuit breakers. We have the 12-volt fuses. And then you notice that little shiny aluminum box down, down below that's the converter that actually takes the 120 volts and makes 12 volts out of it and so basically this is what we call a package unit a combination unit okay and so many of you are going to have this type of a unit
Now, if you take this cover off, please make sure that you are unplugged for any sort of electrical out system, like the shore power outside or your generators, because this panel box will be live. Now, one of the things that we do in a five-day class that we have, we have the students go into that panel box. What we do is have them unplug the the power cord from the pedestal, put a bag over it, put a note on it, so that becomes their lockout tag out, and then I have them go inside that panel box and start tightening up. You would be surprised how many times we find loose wires and we find loose fuse holders, things that the, the fuses are just barely touching or they're arcing across. So these are some of the maintenance things that we can take care of ourselves. okay? Now, on the coach voltage, now that's the house battery. Now see, you're looking at a picture now where we're just looking strictly at the 12 volt side of the panel box. What we're looking at here, these are automotive style fuses, just like we see in our automobile, our pickup. And so what happens is, is that red wire is bringing power in and feeding those fuses, and those fuses take the power off to the left, and you see all those different colored wires, the cream, the yellows, the whites, the oranges, and the yellows, or red stripes, and so on. The power is going out. The power comes out through those fuses, goes out through those wires, and goes to the different things inside your rig. So we're talking about the LED lights, the water pump, uh, the slide out systems, all of those things are going through some sort of fuse protection because we need fuses, we need circuit breakers to protect the wiring to keep things from overheating and catching things on fire. Now if you'll notice we have a deep cycle battery. Now this battery on the outside may look the same as the battery underneath the hood of your vehicle, but inside that battery case it's a totally different breed of cat. The the composition, the plates inside are much heavier, thicker, and carry so much more capacity. Because if you compare the two different types of batteries, the house battery, which is what we're looking at right here, versus the chassis battery, which is the one that we use to start our motor, I want you to compare them to Olympic athletes. The chassis voltage, the one that starts the starter, that turns it on, is like a sprinter. When, it come, when you put the key on, it hammers real hard, it starts the car, but it doesn't stay with you long. That's the reason why you can run a battery down real quick if you just stay on that starter, because it's pulling more power out of that battery than it has in reserve. That battery is made to give a hard punch, but not for a long time. Now, this battery that we're looking at right here is the house battery. This is the deep cycle battery. It doesn't like starter motors because it's not made to do that. It's a marathoner. So it's like that Olympian marathoner. It goes and it goes and it goes. That's why fishermen and people like that use this type of battery for trolling motors. That's why we use it in these RVs so that way we can run our lights. That's why you can boondock with this kind of battery. You know, park in a Walmart parking lot or if you want to go camping up in the woods, you use these deep cycle batteries to make things work for you because they have that stay with you type power. Now, let's talk about terms, okay? I want you to kind of just clear your head of all this thing. Say, I don't understand voltage. I don't understand electricity. I'm afraid of electricity. Folks, it's water. It's just water. Instead of running down a pipe or a garden hose, we're just running it down a wire that's made out of aluminum or made out of a copper. That's all it is. But I want you to think about voltage is nothing more than pressure being applied to the electrons that make up that copper wire. Voltage is pressure. So if we look at a water faucet, say if you turn around and look at that faucet there in your kitchen or, or in a bathroom or wherever you are, if you look at that water faucet and you think, if I turn on that faucet, wonder how much water comes gushing out of there. If you turn that faucet on and that water comes gushing on, you look back and say, whoa, we got good water pressure. But if you turn on that faucet and it dribbles out, what do we say? Whoa, what happened to the water pressure? So it's the same thing here. So when you think about these two different types of voltages that we've been talking about, the 120 volts of pressure versus the 12 volts of pressure, we're dealing with two different types of voltage but we're also dealing with two different types of pressure. So obviously the 120 volts is higher pressure. It operates different types of equipment than the 12 volt pressure voltage would run.
Okay, so voltage is pressure. Make yourself a note because we're going to come back and discuss this in here in a few minutes. Okay, now where do we get this voltage from? If you look at the DC or the battery stuff, we're going to get it out of a battery. We're going to get it out of a solar panel. Did you know a solar panel is a DC device? When it's generating voltage, when that sun is striking that solar panel, it has no on-off switch. So as long as sun is striking it, it's creating DC volts. Wind generators. We see more and more people are going to wind generators out on their sailboats and their RVs. Now, this is not the big wind generator, the big turbines you see when you run up down the interstates and you go through, you know, some of these windy areas like, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, Colorado, and places like that. We're not talking about that kind of wind generator. We're talking about a smaller style wind generator that would be on sailboats and RVs. Now, on the right-hand side, we're typically looking for our voltage to come either from a generator that we carry on board with us or we're getting it from the local municipality and their power source, their power grid. So they may be getting power from uh, hydroelectric like you would see at Niagara Falls or maybe some p nuclear power plant or maybe some uh, uh, you know, coal-fired power plant. Anything that's turning those turbines and generating electricity and coming over those high voltage wires that you see coming across the country, that is the AC volt. So where we get our voltage is from those different sources. So voltage is pressure applied to the electrons, okay? Now amperage. Amperage is nothing more than the flow. Now, if you go down to, and I'm going to use the 7-Eleven. I think everybody knows where 7-Eleven is. If you go down and get you one of those big old Slurpees, and you reach over there and get you a straw, and you happen to pick up a soda straw, a soft drink straw, instead of the big Slurpee straw, there's a considerable difference in the size of them. The soft drink straw is pretty small. So you know that if you're going to start sucking down on that Slurpee with that soda straw, you're going to get a, a hernia trying to suck that, that Slurpee through that straw. But if you reach over and get you one of those big Slurpee straws, guess what? You're able to really pull that thing down. Next thing you know, you've got one of them ice cream headaches going on, right? Well, it's the same thing here. The bigger the wire, the more amperage we can flow down that wire. So if we apply the voltage to it, apply the push to those electrons, the bigger the wire, the more amperage, the more flow we can get. So just like that straw or just like a garden hose, the bigger the hose, the bigger the straw, the bigger the wire, the more amperage we can get. So voltage is pressure, amperage is flow. Okay? Now, there's a unique thing that takes place with amperage. As we're pushing those electrons down that wire, creating that electron flow, that amperage as we call it, not only are we moving electrons down the wire, but as those electrons are moving down that wire, they're banging in around each other, and what they do is they start to create a magnetic force field around the outside of the wire. Now, I know that sounds very Star Trek-y, but guys, this is what happens. This is what makes a doorbell ring, is that when that little lady or, or the kids that are there at 6 o'clock in the morning wanting to see if Junior can come out to play are over there banging around on that doorbell on the front porch, what they're doing is they're sending voltage to a wire that's wound around that doorbell and causes that thing to start making its noise. It does the same thing with turning on lights, you know, pushing relays and, and dimmer switches for your headlights. All of that's being controlled by this magnetic force field. So as we're moving amperage down the wire, we also create a magnetic force field around the wire. Okay? And that, that in and of itself is how a generator works. And you can go into, I mean, folks, we could go into a full semester of just talking about just that. But the thing is, it's amazing what they can do with amperage flowing it down the wire to turn on a water pump or turn on some lights, but also have that magnetic force field coming off of it. Now, the next term that we're after is resistance. I think we've got a pretty good handle on that one. I mean, we've all gone out there to start the vehicle and probably wearing our good clothes, right? We're late for the appointment. We told everybody we'd be there on time. We committed to it, and we put the key in the ignition. thing won't start. So we've got to call in and say, I'm going to be late. I'll be there shortly. I'm in my good clothes, but I've got to work on this car. Pop the hood on that vehicle, and you've got those two big old white snowballs on the terminals of your battery. 
what do we call that? That that stuff on those batteries, those snowballs. We call it corrosion, don't we? And all corrosion is is just a resistive paste, a powder, something that's got in the way of the electron flow from the battery terminal to the cable. Now, we have to take that thing off and clean it. Now, people say, oh, put some Coca-Cola on it. Well, yeah, the acid will eat it off, but the sugar that it leaves behind all of a sudden now causes you more damage to your battery. So that's not the thing to do. But the thing is, is that a little corrosion won't hurt you, but you know what? A whole lot of corrosion will stop the flow. It goes back to that seven-way pin connector that we had a while ago. <coughs> I think that De Deanna asked about a while ago. I think, is it Diane? I think it is. She'd ask, well, go, how do I clean that seven-way connector? There is several different ways that you can clean that. You can use steel wool. Just kind of all you want to do is make it brassy polish. And then once you do that, if you can buy you some of this dielectric grease, uh, you can buy it at AutoZone, any place like that. They put it on electrical connections. Or you can buy some stuff called Noox and put on it. But what you're trying to do is to get that corrosion cleared up on that seven pin connector so when you plug it back into your rig you've got good connection. Well it'd be the same thing here. When you go to take that terminal, that cable off of that terminal, you're going to have to get all that old green gunky stuff off of there and clean it, probably with some water and baking soda, scrape it, get that material, get the raw steel or raw aluminum, or not aluminum, but the uh, raw lead back so that way you can get a good electrical connection because if you have too much resistance electrons won't flow it takes more pressure to push those electrons I was working on a rig the other day uh, this week's matter of fact this campground that we're staying at here in Indiana uh, this gentleman was having trouble getting his slide out to move and what happened was he had a fuse in his fuse panel box that had corrosion on it and it wasn't making good contact so when it didn't make good contact, wouldn't allow enough voltage and pressure or amperage flow to be going to that electric motor to make that motor move that slide out. So when you look at the restriction, the friction of the connections and the conductors and the device, all of those things slow down the pressure, slow down that flow, and causes that pressure to drop. And so therefore, the device that you're trying to operate can't work. Some of it may be too small of wire. And I'm going to show you some things here in a few minutes to let you see what I'm talking about when you start talking about too small of a wire. So just remember, the bigger the wire, the more amperage you can move. What about if you tie two or three extension cords together? All of a sudden, what does that do to the pressure being applied to those electrons? It may have been fine going into that first extension cord, comes out of that first extension cord, it's decreased a little bit, but by the time it comes out of that second extension cord, you know, you may have dropped some voltage. Because one, you got the length, and then also you got maybe the diameter of that. Uh, it's nothing unusual to see, maybe you had 115 volts coming in, going into that extension cord, but by the time you run, let's say, a 200, uh, feet of extension cord out there, you may be down below 100 volts on the other end of that cord. Well, guess what doesn't work as well? Air conditioners, lights, whatever you're trying to run. So if you have to have, if you're going to have to make that kind of long run, you want to get a bigger diameter extension cord so that way you can move more amperage down that wire. Now, when I say conductor material, uh, where a lot of people don't realize aluminum and, and copper, they don't conduct electricity to the same. Aluminum doesn't conduct as well for its size that copper does. We also know that corrosion or loose connections, like that happened in that fuse panel I was working with the other day, or maybe even the friction of the of devices. I mean, light bulbs. Now, you think about in a brick and stick home, you know, if you've got, um, let's say, an electric cooktop, you turn that on, and all of a sudden that, that element starts getting cherry red, what that is is causing friction for those electrons when they start coming through there. And so what happens is that heating element starts getting hot and we use it to pop our jiffy pop popcorn or whatever it is that we're working with, right? Or fixing dinner or whatever. But sometimes we can use it to our favor, like an electric heating element in a water heater, but other times a hot spot, a hot wire, is not a good thing. So it depends on what the application is and what we're trying to get it to do for us. Okay? So voltage is pressure, amperage is flow, and resistance is what? 
it's a restriction. Now you use you'll see the terminology. See where it says you may see R, or you may see somebody call it ohms continuity, or you may have the omega signal here or the sine. Okay, so any time that you're looking at charts, you may see any one of those type of symbols to indicate resistance. Now the next term is called wattage. Wattage is nothing more than a way that we calculate power. Okay, it, you know we, we want to be able to compare apples to apples is what we're after. So the Underwriters Laboratory here in, the, in North America requires us to be able to be able to look at a data plate on an appliance and know exactly how much power it's going to be able to consume for us. Okay. So for instance, the other day I was down at Walmart and I was kind of cruising through the kitchen area waiting on Lady E to pick up some things, and I noticed they had a microwave oven on sale for forty six bucks. Now that caught my eye because I thought, really, 46 bucks? Walked over there and I looked at the box and it had something like 550 watts. I'm thinking, wait a minute, 550 watts? I'm thinking, you know, we've got in our rig, we've got a 1,000 watt microwave and it takes right at 2 minutes and 45 seconds for my popcorn to pop. Now, if I were to take that same popcorn bag and put it in that 550 watt microwave, it might take it five or six minutes because wattage is the amount of power, the amount of heat, what it, you know, the energy that it's going to take to do its job. So obviously you want to operate with as much wattage as you possibly can, as much wattage that your uh, panel box will handle. But what we want to think about wattage is it's, it's power. You know, we talked about a, a battery being a piggy bank. Well, just think about this water tower. When we know that the two most common, busiest times in a 24-hour period for a water tower is, is early in the morning after everybody gets up, and so everybody's taking their showers, get everybody ready to go to school, go to work, and so the municipality's water pumps are struggling to keep up with the demand. So they supplement the water supply. What they need, they pull water out of that tower. Now, while everybody's gone to work, that water tower's filling up, or maybe at night that water tower's filling up, so that way the next time we need it, which is typically after 5 o'clock when everybody comes home, the water tower supplements again. So now, here's what I want you to think about. This is a formula I want you to write down because this formula is how we calculate everything. And I'm going to show you a chart here in just a minute. Voltage, which is push, which is the pressure on electrons, times the amperage. So if you've got a 30 amp power cord, so the voltage times the amperage equals the wattage. Okay? Voltage times amperage equals the wattage. Now, let's take a look. This is the typical power requirements for some RV devices. Most air conditioners have a 20 amp circuit breaker. And so what we're saying is, is that this air conditioner could run as high as 20, could pull as much as 20 amps of current flow. Now typically they won't be pushing that much. Now when they first start, it's kind of like push starting an automobile, it takes a lot more, but for a fraction of a second it'll pull more than it'll drop back. But the hotter it is outside, the harder that air conditioner has to work, which means it'll pull more amperage. But what I want you to notice is, is that the big air conditioners that's sitting up on the roof of your RV, it's 120 volts, 20 amp circuit breaker, so it takes 2400 watts. So 20 amps times 120 volts is 2400 watts. Look at the electric water heater. Now this is the heating element, the water heater. It's a 1500 watt heating element. It's pulling 12 and a half amps. Microwave oven. See, now I've got that one beefed up a little bit. I bet Lady E'd love to have a 1536 watt uh, micro microwave. Boy, she, our popcorn would be cooked in about 90 seconds with that kind of wattage. Coffee pot, George Foreman grills, hair dryers, curling irons. So those of you that have a 30 amp power cord, just think, if you're running your air conditioner, just think how little power you have left, how little amperage you have left to operate with. And this is what becomes a critical thing for us. we got to go into energy conservation mode. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Okay, so when you begin to look at this thing, in terms of what we're pulling, you've got to realize that we're pulling power, but we only have so much power to work with. Okay, now, here's how you can help yourself. 
I'm going to strongly encourage you to stay involved with RV tips, and I think there's some serious numbers there. And I've been kind of just, I've been lurking, watching, seeing what you guys are doing. And, and I'll tell you, folks, it's amazing. You've got some folks online, got some good answers. You've got some sharp folks there. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they're not some solid technicians, some certified techs there. But those of you that are coming to learn, this is a good watering hole to come to. They've got some good information, and I've noticed that if you ask a question, I can sense that some of you have been a little hesitant because you think, oh, that's a stupid question to ask. No, it's not. We were all asking the same question before somebody shared it with us. Okay. So what I want you to do is to glean as much information as you can there. I want you to gain confidence by learning about your RV lifestyle. What are some of the, th and I'm going to show you some of the things that you can do to, to get more information. Because information is the key of thumping that purple monkey off of your shoulder. This is the key to getting your confidence, getting you that peace of mind so you know that, hey, I can do this 80% of the things. Guys, it is very rewarding for me to spend time with someone, a young man or a lady or whoever, and working with them in some of our classes. And then they'll write back and say, Cooper, you're not going to believe. The confidence I had, I was jumped right in and I took care of that because what happened was is they weren't afraid of it and that's where we need you to be because if you want to depend on somebody else you're going to be at their mercy their timetable and when they can get to you and how much money you've got in your wallet but so many things we can do ourselves. so I need you to educate yourself on how, about the RV lifestyle how things work how to do the basic maintenance I mean, whether it's a refrigerator, a furnace, a water heater, an uh, air conditioner, these are things that we can take care of ourselves. If you come over to Mobile RV Academy, I've got some DVDs I can share with you. It'll take you through and show you how to take things apart and put things back together. But those of you that are wanting and maybe even looking about going into this, this lifestyle, this what we call work camping, take a look at this. If this is something you're thinking about doing, maybe you can get, and I've used the term career, but you know what? If you enjoy it, I don't think it's a career uh, because, quite honestly, Lady E and I have been on the road a little over four years now, and uh, I don't know. I enjoy it. I know I work on things, and I putz around with this and that, but you know what? It's a world of difference between putting your feet on the floor in, in your bedroom and just thinking you're going to throw up because you didn't want to go to work, but you had to to all of a sudden now you have this lifestyle to where you kind of come and go. Yeah, you've got certain responsibilities. We all do. That's part of being a human. But it's amazing when you can call the shots yourself. And that's what we want you to be able to do. Now, let me just share with you, one of the sponsors wanted me to, to open this opportunity up to you is Work Camper News. If you're not familiar with them, they have an online magazine. They also have a hard copy that they print. But they have got a ton of information about jobs and opportunities that are out there that you can go and do. Um, they've got a small business school to teach you how to start a business on the road. Folks, I've got a business degree. And it wasn't until I sat down and visited with these guys that I really understood I wasn't running it correctly. I had the wrong entity. And I was getting taxed to the nth degree. It didn't need to be. But it's amazing how you can restructure yourself to where your traveling expenses you can write off because they become part of your living expense or part of your business expense. So take a look at these guys. Now, if you go to workcamper.com or you call that number and just... You know, you can subscribe, and I, and I understand what they're willing to do. If you, I think it's what fifty-nine bucks a year or something like that. And if you sign up and you put in there that it was, you know, RV tips, then what they'll do is they'll give you an extra three months, so that way you can get in there. But they've got a program in there called the Dreamer program, and what they do is they take you through a whole lot of classes and showing you, you know, where's the ideal place for your mail to come to, where's your domicile. They take you through all this stuff, and trust me. They, they took me by the hand because I, I hit that terror barrier. I was ready to go. I was gung-ho, and all of a sudden it dawned on me, uh, uh, how am I going to do this? And all of a sudden they say, let me show you. They take you past the terror barrier and walk you through it. Okay. Now, here's a course I want you to take a look at as well. Um, and this is really a this big one right here. We call it the training triad. But the big thing that I see more people coming into, they said, I want to master my own RV. Now, this is a five-day 
hands-on class that we hold throughout different parts of the country. Like for instance, uh, we'll be doing a class up here in Shipshawana here, I think it's next week or so. And there's others, if you go to this website here, RB Tech Course, you'll see a list of courses and we're always adding new places. But what it is, you bring your RV and that is your lab. Now if you say, well, I, I'm not, I haven't bought an RV yet. Well, that's okay. We'll partner you up with everybody because what we find is is that the more you know before you buy an RV, the less likely you are to make a giant boo-boo. But what we want to do is to take you through and show you, go into so much more depth on how things work because there's so much more to these RVs than just what we're reading on just these forums. So much more than what we read in the books. So if you'll come, we'll spend five days with you. We do half a day in the classroom in the morning typically, and then we go outside in the afternoon. It's hands-on because that's how most of us learn is hands-on. Now, some of you are going to say, you know what, I want to go a step further. We have a lot of folks that are taking that very knowledge right here, and whether you're solo, male, female, are taking these and maybe taking jobs at work campings, at, at campgrounds, at uh, service centers. I've got dealerships that have got a standing order say, hey, if you've got graduates that come through your program, please give them my name and number. I am looking to hire. So they're willing to take you because they know you've got a solid foundation to work with. Electrical, plumbing, uh, the appliances, propane water systems, roof systems, so all of these things in five days. So that way you can take care of yourself, but also you can begin to start taking care of others and earn some money. We've got folks that actually live full-time in RVs, and they also travel from campground to campground, and when they're there, they hang out their shingle and say, hey, I do maintenance, I do I do service work, or, or I do spring maintenance on water heaters, and so, you know, pick up an extra 75, 100 bucks. It's amazing and get up on somebody's roof and seal you know, with DICOR and seal the, you know, any potential areas for leaks and so on. And then many of you are going a step further and becoming RV inspectors. Now we've got two different levels. We have a level one and a level one when you come out of this course you will be classified as a level one inspector and you'll be able to go and do VIN verifications, do extended service agreements. And it's usually like a three or four page inspection report. It takes you a couple of hours to do it, but it's amazing how many folks we have doing that. Then we have other we have one more class above that that is a, a hands-on class. It's what we call the learn by doing. It's the advanced class. We teach you how to be what we call a level two inspector. And this is where you inspect RVs for dealerships for their certified pre-owned program. Or you inspect it for individuals that are looking to buy this unit and want to know what's working, what's not working. And we teach you how to create a report, you know, 50, 60, 70 page or 80 page report, pictures, how to use the software, how to scope an RV. So it's kind of like, and, and, and one of the students really coined the phrase and I thought they did it right. You learn how to inspect an RV like a home inspector inspects, okay? Okay, so let's move on. But I want you to take a look at this course, the RV Tech course, and we've got a description of what's going on there. And basically, what you're looking at here is a way to go in and figure out how your unit works. Now, Lady E passed me a note here, and somebody asking a question: How many amp draw do they have drawing the, for the refrigerator down? Well, part of it's going to depend on the refrigerator. If it's one of these big four-door mama jamas, this thing may draw five, sometimes even pushing. 10 amps. Now, those of you that maybe have the little two-door refrigerators, your refrigerator may only be pulling three or four amps of 120 volts. So, those of you that have inverters, you have to be careful, you know, that inverters, that, that device that pulls power out of a battery makes 120 volts, you've got to make sure you have the right inverter that can handle the power that you're pulling. So, these are things that we talk about in these classes because it's got to make sense to us or it's of no value to us. And so that's what I want to make sure that when you come and spend five days with us that we'll walk you through and prepare you. Because I want to make sure that you know how to take care of yourself, help you take care of others, and if you want to have a business on the road, here's an opportunity for you. And let me just speak to the ladies in particular. Ladies, you don't have to be afraid. 
You don't have to be intimidated. We have ladies in our classes all the time. And as a matter of fact, we actually have ladies that do inspections to the point to where we have other ladies that call and say, hey, do you happen to have a lady inspector? I'd be more comfortable with a woman coming and talking with me and doing my inspection. So there is kind of a unique niche in the market for you guys if you're interested in it, okay? Now in this five day class, here's what you're seeing us, we're outside looking at a water heater. This was just before, we're talking about how it works, what's going on, how it fires, how it operates on 12 volts to run the propane, and how it operates on 120 volts to run the heating element, but we're going to take it apart here in just a little bit. I'm not showing you where we've got this thing all strode out, but that's important because I want you to see it work when you took it apart, and it worked after you put it back together because it's so important that you feel comfortable in what you're doing, okay? Now, if you can't come to the five-day class, I want you to take a look. We have a new program called the Live Stream Learning. So let's just say that we happen to be doing a class, say, in Pennsylvania. But you're sitting in California, and it's just you just can't get away. And so what you do is you say, you know what? I know what I'll do is I'll watch that live stream. So what you're going to be doing is sitting in on the same class that the five-day people are. It's being shot to you via the internet live stream. Live, you can ask questions and we can talk back and forth. Now, when we go out in the field, I have you do the same thing on your rig. I've given you assignments already ahead of time, things I need you to do, things I need you to take apart, things I need you to test. We're going to show you how to use your volt ohm meter so you can use your multimeter to check for voltage and check for resistance and things like that. And you're going to do the same thing if you do it live stream. Now, live stream is a little less expensive, but... <laughs> And I guess this is the drawback, if it really is a drawback, is that you know, you're not there touching and feeling it with us. And, and I wish I could have everybody there, but sometimes it just doesn't work out. But here's a live stream option that might be for you. Now, if you want to go and take a look at this, it's called rbtechcourse.com forward slash live dash stream. And it, it talks about the same course, but it also talks about how you get set up to do it. You can do it with sitting right here in your computer, just like what you're doing right here. And then, when the live stream or when this live day five day class is over with, you still have 30 days to go back and look at this material over and over and over again. So that way, you know, you can sleep on it, come back the next day, watch it, do some other things like that. So here's your an opportunity to go back and see it again. Okay, so that way you can get the same instruction, the same things. Where you'll see the other people in the class that are here with us. You'll see them in the class, but you'll be part of them. Except you'll be across the country watching on your computer. I'd be amiss if I didn't mention our friends at RV Inspection Connection. Uh, those of you that are looking about buying a used unit, please, please take a look at this. Go to RVInspection.com. Um, those of you that have motorhomes, this last year uh, we did inspections on motorhomes and 32%, 32% of the motorhomes that we pulled fluid samples on showed to have some sort of problem with the fluid, the, the engine oil. Now some of them may have been as simple as maybe the oil needed to be changed or maybe fuel injectors or something is spewing too much fuel in there and diluting the oil. But what we also found, there were many, many units that were finding piston and bearing material floating around in that oil. So it told us that this unit that this person was going to be buying was on the way to having a catastrophic failure. We can pull samples on the transmissions. That's another issue that we see, particularly on a lot of Class C motorhomes. If somebody's been pulling a lot of vehicles behind it, it really stresses these transmissions. So, you know... Save yourself fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars for a new transmission by knowing just by having somebody do an inspection on this thing and go through it, make sure everything works, and then have them pull the fluid samples on it. So that way you get the report and you can read it and know the condition of it before you put your money down on it. I uh, cannot tell you the number of people have called us and said this was the best, you know, five hundred dollars I spent, or you know, some of these big diesel pushers. I mean. I mean, you talk about a, a motorhome, a hundred thousand dollars plus. Okay, somebody spends 
fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars for it and got all these oil samples and found out all kinds of things. Like one guy told me, he said that was the best money I spent because it saved me from dropping about eighteen thousand dollars for a diesel engine because I found some things. He said, I don't need somebody else's money pit, which I totally understand. Uh, we have, and, and what you're looking at here is two individuals, a young lady we have, she's out of California. Uh, Sue is also a bookkeeper. <laughs> now, doesn't that grab you, huh? And this gentleman has got his hat on, he's got his back to us. Dave is a professional clown. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but both of them do inspections. They do level two inspections, and what they're doing here is an inspection on some units that they were hired to do, and they come in, do the report, Present it to the cus and it's presented to the customer just like a home inspection report is. So let's go back. Allow me to thank the people that sponsored this, so that way we could be here. Because, uh, folks, let me just tell you, it takes, as you well know, if you're traveling, it takes money to put fuel in the tank and pay for these RV sites. And so these guys at Work Camper News are gracious enough to take care of us. And I appreciate what they do for us. So, Lady E, let's open up the, the mic and see what questions that you have and make sure we've responded to some of the questions that you had before and uh, see what we have. Okay, great. All right, we did have a specific question about the inverter versus the converter. Okay. Can you give us an instance so you can give us an example of what each one of those do? Okay, a converter is going to take 120 volts and change it to 12 volts DC to power the batteries and all the uh, house type battery 12 volt stuff. Okay, so it converts. It's a battery charger. So just like a charger, the word charger starts with a C, so does a converter. Now an inverter is a little bit different animal. It actually reaches over and takes that 12 volt power out of those batteries and makes 120 volts to run appliances. Now there are some drawbacks with some of these inverters. Sometimes they're not able to replace uh, generators because we're not quite there yet, but it's phenomenal what they will do. For instance, in Lady E's RV that she has, we have a house type refrigerator big Samsung three-door refrigerator, and we can run down the highway running off our batteries to run that refrigerator, even though it's a residential refrigerator, because we have an inverter that's running the compressor. Uh, some of you may also have inverters if you've got CPAP machines, you know, those breathing machines or oxygen concentrators, um, other, and, and maybe some of you even boondock and you want to run some of your televisions and things like that. So an inverter takes battery power to run 120 volt devices. So if you're boondocking, you know, you might have solar panels, you might have wind generators, those things feeding the battery and then the battery feeds the inverter and then the inverter feeds that appliance that you have to go. So that's the two differences. Now, everybody is going to have a converter. That's pretty standard. If you've got a circuit breaker panel box, you've got a battery, there's going to be typically a converter in there making 120 volts, making 12 volts. But an inverter is an option that you purchase. It's typically, if you have an inverter, you're going to know it because, you know, someone's going to make sure that when you bought it, they made sure that you knew that, hey, that was an option. If you're buying used, that's an important thing to make sure it's checked out because, Sometimes they get abused and they burn up. So these are things that you want to know about. Okay. Okay, we have a few more questions that have just rolled in. Okay. Okay, D Dale has asked, should we disconnect the coach battery to tighten screws in the fuse panel, similar to unplugging the shore power to tighten the circuit breaker screws? Okay, so that question came from Dale, you say? Correct. Uh, Dale, you know that would be a, that would be a very good idea. Most of you probably have a disconnect switch. Um, you know, some people say, "Oh, I'm not going to touch anything." Hey, that's uh, that's up to you. You know, <laughs> it's uh, you might throw a little spark, but unless you get that thing shorted across, you're typically not going to have anything. But I'm like you. I I, I think I'd want to err on the side of, "Hey, let's just be safe." You know, I don't want to play sparky. So I'm like you. I'd go ahead and disconnect my power 
and that way you tighten everything up and go from there. Uh, this is one of the things that we do, Dale, in that five-day class with everybody. And and I can say this in the three years that we've been doing these three day, these five-day classes. In the three years, I don't know that we. Well, I know we've had in every class that we've done, we've had at least one and several times more than one individual had some sort of wiring issue inside their panel box. Wires were loose, wires were getting hot, uh, you know, any kind of things like that. And it just means it's, it's disaster waiting to happen. And until you've had your spouse wake you up in the middle of the night and say, tell you the kitchen's on fire, you don't know what panic is. And Lady E did that to me one time. She said, the kitchen's on fire. And what we had was, shame on me. We had picked up this brand new unit, and I didn't go through it like I should have. I took for granted that they had done their pre-delivery inspection, and we had a loose wire. And it was at the, uh, it was on the 120 volt side, and basically what it was doing, it was causing the the microwave oven. She left the light on as a night light, which is what we did. And it caused just enough draw to cause that thing to arc. And let me tell you, it was shooting fire because all of a sudden that circuit board in that microwave started going bad. All of a sudden lights went out, but when it was all said and done, we lost the television, we lost the microwave, we lost the um, converter. And that was a $600 pop. Let me tell you, that was a spank I didn't want. And the power supply for her computer. So loose wiring is not a good thing. So that's one of the things that we that's top on the list that we take care of. Professor. Yes, ma'am. Also, remember what happened just this last week. We had some people roll into the campground we're in, and they did have a loose wire. You recall that? Oh, guys, talk about a nightmare. His power cord. The wire, you know, if you know what I'm talking about, the twist lock, the little orange that you put plug in and you turn it to the right and you tighten up that black ring, the wires inside there, one of them had come loose and it was arcing across. When it was all said and done, knocked out the television, the microwave, um, ceiling, the ceiling fan was shooting sparks out. Luckily, they had not turned on the air conditioner, or they'd been, you know, twelve hundred dollars for another air conditioner. So she absolutely, Lady E's right. We worked on that thing till two o'clock in the morning. That's when I finally got home and got to bed. But these poor folks, you know, they were they were dead in the water, dead in the water. He told me that, he, you know, we were able to patch his power cord up and get him going. And the next morning, he went and bought a new one, two hundred and seventy-five dollars for a new fifty-amp power cord for that rig. So, here again, you know, electrical is a critical, critical thing. Okay, we have another question. This comes from Michael. When I told my Ford Explorer Sport Track behind my RV a 2010 Amon Daybreak 3370. Sometimes the battery in the truck is dead when I my destination. Do you have any ideas why this might be happening? Wow. Um, Michael, are you having to turn on your ignition when you're driving down the highway? You know, some, some applications, they require you to turn on your ignition, supposedly put on accessories. I'm wondering if that's doing it. Um, if not, I wonder... Wonder if there's a, a miswire in that seven-pin connector, or that's you know the umbilical cord from your your motorhome back to the uh, to the vehicle that you're pulling. I think you probably run in what with about a four-pin connector, I believe, isn't it? And so there, I wonder if there's a miswire there. Boy, howdy, that that's one of those things you have to say. Okay, what's causing this thing to to bleed it down? I'm kind of curious, Michael, can you tell us about how long it takes it typically to bleed down? I mean, is it like within two or three hours, or is it after six or eight hours, or what is it? He did come back and say, yes, it's during towing, and he has a tow neutral switch that he uses, and usually about six hours plus, that's when his battery goes down. Really? You would think that the motorhome would be pumping some power back there, wouldn't you? Wow. Have you had a chance to take it in shop? Because somebody's going to need to go through that thing and see how it got wired. Maybe somebody, and you always hate to think that somebody boo-booed. But it does happen, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. 
and I, man. So, so you recommend that he should have it checked out at a yeah. service? I know service. this sounds sounds terrible after we've been talking 80, 20, but Michael, I'm afraid I'm going to have to say that's going to be one of those 20 percenters right there. Um, would you do me a favor? Once you figure out, or once they find out what it is, would you drop a line on RV tips? I mean, give everybody a chance to learn from the trials and tribulations that you're going through on this thing. That, oh man, I'm sorry you have to go through that. Uh, wow. Well, Professor, um, someone has spoke up and said thanks so much for sharing your education. They've enjoyed it so much. We've had others to say there are other very large Facebook groups that are on, um, you know, are out there that people are needing education. So please consider <laughs> going over and helping those guys. Um, but basically, that brings us brings us to the end of our questions. Uh, if anybody should have anything else, please type uh, because it's just a few minutes after the hour. So if you have any more questions, you know, he'll be happy to take them. Yes. And the other thing is, I want to make sure is that. Um, if you go to you know that RV tech course or anything else like that put in there RV tips cuz you know I always need to know where you guys came from cuz you know you always want okay time spent was it spent well with these folks i mean did did someone benefit from it did they come sign up for a class or because you know what if we don't look out for ourselves nobody else will and these shops are so busy right now and sometimes to even get into a shop is a major deal and so by having you guys have this RV tips page, I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful resource. But what I'd like to offer, also offer you is an opportunity to get some education. So that way you can thump that purple monkey off your shoulder. That way you can go do this yourself. Because guys and ladies, I'm here to tell you, there's nothing more satisfying to dust your hands off and say, I fixed that. I took care of that. And not in an arrogant way, but just, I don't know, it just it gives you that confidence. So that way you're not afraid to strike out. And I have such high regard for particularly the solos. You guys, you ladies that take off, you know, gutsy as you guys can be. So ladies, come. Spend some time. I promise you we'll give you everything we've got in five days. And, and like I tell everybody, you'll be a tired puppy when you leave on Friday afternoon or Friday evening. Because uh, what we do typically is we'll do class and we'll do a potluck in the middle of the week and then we'll do a potluck and graduation on the last day. And, and what happens is we develop new friendship. And it's a, you know, because as you're out traveling around, sometimes you need to be able to say, hey, I need to ask a question and, and, and send us an email. You know, if you've been to one of our classes, I'm going to give you my cell phone number, give you emails, so that way we can be in touch with one another. I can't promise you I can get a hold of you because I may right away because I may be in class, but I'll get back with you so we can talk and get things going for you. So come join us. Take more questions. Oh, well, that's good. Take a look at uh, Work Camper News because, guys, I, I can tell you from just – this is me. Lady E, had she was a full-timer when we met. We met on Batch.com. And so we met, I was teaching there at the college, and she was full-timing it, and she said, let's go full-timing. And I thought, oh, that sounded like a great idea. And then all of a sudden, it just kind of hit me. It's like, oh, this is for real. And even though I, I, I had the head knowledge and the hand knowledge, because I've turned a lot of wrenches for a long time, but sometimes it's just that, oh, what am I going to do if I, oh, I won't have, but you know what? They'll coach you through it. They'll show you. And that's what you want. Somebody take you by the hand, guide you through it. Okay, Lady E, we're ready. Okay, and I have another question from Michael. I have four deep cycle coach batteries and a diesel pusher that has a residential fridge. I have two open bays to to add two more coach batteries. The 6.71 Cummings has a 160 amp alternator. Should I upgrade the alternator to a 240 amp? You know, Michael, you know, honestly, I'd try it without it first. I hate to see you spend that kind of money, but I mean, you know, a lot of it's going to be what's your comfort level. If your gut tells you that, you know, the one you've been running, the 160 has is, is not been quite getting it or it's just barely, then of course upgrade it. But if you've not had any issues with it, try it and see. You'll know soon enough. And 
of course, you know, I, I guess I tend to go on more of the conservative side because you know money's involved and time's involved. Uh, but what you, folks, what he's talking about here is 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 a great idea because what he's going to do is he's going to extend his staying time if he boondocks or he's going to extend the time he can run that refrigerator and some of these other items. I mean, that that's the answer right there. If you're going to be out on the road, and you're going to boondock, or you're, you know, he's he's thinking the right way. And and the good thing about him, he's got the storage capacity and the capability to transport more batteries. The drawback, those of us that have towables, fifth wheels, travel trailers, you know, weight becomes an issue for us. So we have to kind of weigh the the balances, the pros and cons. But so like Michael may have the ability to do that without even breaking a sweat. So if it was me, Michael, I'd. I'd try it and see if the batteries, or if the alternator keeps up with the batteries. If it doesn't, then hey, you know you got an option. You know you can beef it up, and you got you can keep on going then. Um, professor, give us your opinion on an EMS. We have Dave here. He uh, he says he has a 50 amp service fifth wheel. Okay, EMS stands for Energy Management System. And there's different types. Some of them are built in. Some of them may even came with your rig. Some of the, and typically you'll see them on your high-end fifth wheels, high-end motorhomes. Uh, but basically, what it's doing is when you plug into shore power, it reaches back and looks and kind of plays Sherlock Holmes and looks at that electrical and says, "Hey, is the wiring correct? Am I getting the correct voltage?" Is everything, you know, because you never know who's been in that panel box. And sometimes you've got what we call a putter butt. That's, that's a guy who's got more time on his hands than he knows that he's got knowledge. But a putter butt may have been in there, and he may have been tweaking around, moving some wires around that panel box, and didn't really know what he was doing. And so you come along, and you, you park in that spot. And if, if you just plug your rig right into it, if he's miswired, he's going to he's going to smoke some stuff in your rig and when you start looking at twelve hundred dollars for an air conditioner uh, six seven eight nine hundred dollars for a converter and you know people like Michael that are running inverters oh lord you know he's probably running an inverter there would wouldn't be a bit surprised if he's not running about two grand or more for that thing so that EMS system what it's doing is it's it's a protection the other thing, and this is something that we had happen to us this week, is that we have an EMS system that we plug into the pedestal, then we plug our power cord into it. So whenever we come into a campground, we plug into that pedestal before I even back the unit into space or even start setting up because I want to know, is that pedestal clean? Is it giving me what I'm supposed to? And it'll tell me, you know, voltage good, and it'll be a signal. But we've backed into places before, and I made the mistake one time where I had it all set up. I had the water hooked up, the sewer, everything. Went to plug in, and one of the wires was bad. And one of the circuit breakers inside that panel box was bad. The wire was basically burnt off of the circuit breakers, what it was. Went up to the office, and they said, well, the guy before you didn't have any problems. Said, well, we got problems now. And you know what? If I had plugged into that thing, if I'd been the guy before that and plugged in one of those had that bad wiring, it could have taken out some of my equipment. But that EMS system is built in such a way to where it monitors for a few minutes, you know, anywhere from a minute and a half to three minutes, it will sit there and pulse and look and monitor and monitor and monitor before it allows the power to pass through into your rig. Now where this becomes critical is if say you have a lightning storm come through. Not only does this thing act like a surge protector, kind of like you know, that power strip that you plug your computer into, because you got your whole RV plugged into it, so it's acting like a surge protector, but it also, when the power does come back on and everybody else in the campgrounds, air conditioners, and everything else comes on at one time, all of that equipment is straining to get enough power, enough pressure. And with your EMS system, it's sitting there and says, uh-uh, we're uh-uh, we don't want any part of this game. We're not going to that party. So what it does is it just waits. And then when everybody else gets up and running, then it makes connection for you and lets you have power. Because I know we've all been there. We've watched the power come out, and then when the new power comes on, how the lights get real, real dim, and sometimes they even go back out, then they come back on. That's terrible. That's horrible for our equipment. So that EMS system, it's there acting like a security guard 
it's their traffic cop whatever term you want to use it's there to protect and to monitor that electrical coming into your unit so I know that they're a little pricey uh, 50 amp and, and like the one that we have where you plug it into the pedestal and you plug your cord into it's gonna run you about 350 bucks but you know what that is cheap cheap insurance and uh, all you have to do is have one hit and you wipe out wiring inside the walls, inside the ceilings. And folks, when you burn wiring inside those places, you can't get to it. Uh, so, you know, it's protection. I still don't understand why the manufacturers don't install them, but they don't. But that's something that we can put on. If you've got a 30 amp service, it's probably going to be about 200, 250 bucks for that one. But it's just, guys, it's just protection because you're coming into places that you don't know who's been there and who's done things to the pedestal or even monkey wired it you don't know well professor um just to mention there is a difference between a surge protector and an ems system yes yes there is can we tell them just explain that real quick okay. when you go to camping world and these other places they're going to say you so here's the less expensive one and look at it and it's going to say surge protection and all it is is taking the hammer that comes down that wire. In other words, if that thing took a voltage spike or something, then it absorbs it. What you want is the next level of protection. You want the EMS system that gives not only surge protection, but also voltage and current monitoring. So not only is it monitoring when you first turn everything on, but while you're sleeping at night, it's the silent guardian. It's out there monitoring, and that's what you want. You want surge protection, yes. I mean, that's absolute. But go a step further. Get the get more because of what it'll protect. So like Lady E says, there is a difference. And, and people, a lot of times the clerks in these stores don't understand. They say, well, you know, this is less expensive. This will do, do the same thing. Uh-uh. No, it won't. And you won't appreciate it until you're over here trying to figure out how you're going to pay for two air conditioners and a converter and all this other stuff. So get the EMS system because it'll have both components that you need. Professor, I have another question. What do you think is better for the batteries when in storage? I have a Class A with an inverter plugged into 120 to keep the batteries charged or unplug and hit the, the coach kill switch? Oh boy, you know, <laughs> you sit around a campfire and this is the dialogue that you have because of the great debate. Um, if I have my brothers, I'd rather you definitely want to keep, you've got to keep these batteries charged. There's no way around it because just the battery just sitting there nothing being done if it's just sitting on the bench it's going to lose between three quarters and one volt per month just sitting there because of the internal resistance the way that battery is made so you've got to charge it some way somehow some coaches the higher end coaches if that battery if that coach loses its power it loses its program and you're talking four or five hundred dollars to reprogram all the controls the electronics in that thing. So you definitely cannot afford for that thing to be without uh, good charge batteries. If your unit is one of those units that they specifically say in the owner's manual to leave it plugged in, leave it plugged in. If they don't say, then buy you one of those battery minders or battery tenders, which is basically a trickle charger. And what it's going to do is it's going to feed power to that battery, but not overcharge it where you boil the uh, gases and gas off hydrogen. Now, some of you will even go a step further with your motor home. Your unit, even if you were plugged in to shore power or have the trickle charger on your batteries, it may not be and may not have the wiring set up to charge the chassis battery that starts the starter. And so for those people that maybe are going to be boondocking or maybe say like for snowbirds, if you guys go down and you park someplace for, say you get there in November and you don't leave till April, it may be that the house batteries, the deep cycle batteries are doing just fine because you're plugged into shore power, but that battery underneath the hood may go down.
So I know folks that will put a battery minder or battery tender on that battery or go buy them a small solar panel. And so that way, lay it up there in the dashboard, or I've even seen people put zip ties and tie it onto the front grill or wherever the batteries are. And so that way, if the sun's shining, it's charging those batteries, trickle charge them. Because depending on how your rig was wired up, some rigs, will, when you plug them into shore power, it will charge both sets of batteries, but not always. And so be aware of that. That's part of learning about your rig, learning how it was built, and learning the different electrical systems, if they're tied together or if they actually operate independent one of another. Okay. Um, here's a comment from Susan. She says that her motorhome will not generally charge the towed batteries unless you add a separate wire. My car says to start and run every four hours. Ah. So that's interesting. That's in interesting. Susan, what kind of vehicle do you have that you're the tow that you're pulling? Okay, we'll wait for that answer. Okay. Um Judith says, thanks, Professor, for all the awesome information. She appreciates you so much. Uh, Dave, he says, thank you for the excellent information. He said he's learned a lot. We've got another fella, William, thank you for the education. He's a newbie from sunny Florida. <laughs> you, know, you know, from what I... I'm reading here on the screen, there's a lot of people out there that have just really gotten a lot from what you've talked about tonight, Professor, so everybody really appreciates you taking okay. the time to be here. Well, maybe okay. we can uh, make arrangements to come back, because like I said, we had talked about doing a series. If we do nothing more than give you a good solid base to start with, but folks, this is a long ways from everything that you really, really need. I mean, I'm trying to keep you out of the shops as much as possible. Because here's the thing that I do know about maintenance. For every one hour of maintenance that you do on your RV, saves you 10 hours of broke down on the side of the highway or 10 hours in a shop. And so just doing just basic maintenance things that we can, we can work with you on and show you will keep you out of the shop and keep that money in your back pocket. Awesome. Okay, Susan has answered. She has a Honda Element being towed by an adventurer. By an adventurer. Four, mm -hmm, a four-pin connection. Okay, so about four hours on that. Interesting. Well, I guess that was Michael that was having that issue, wasn't he? I'm wondering mm -hmm. if that thing's not pulling more power. Michael, there's got to be a way around that. There's got to be a way that you can run an extra power to feed that battery, and then when you disconnect, you know, you're disconnecting the motorhome from it. So mm -hmm. very good. Folks, okay. I appreciate your time. We won't take up any more of it. We've run over a little bit, but I appreciate everything that everyone's done this afternoon. And uh, Ed, was there any parting words that you wanted to share or anything you wanted to share with everyone? No, I just want to thank you and Lady E for your time and effort. And I want to thank everybody in the group for coming by. I hope you all learned a lot and are open to learning some more. So, very good. Ed, thank you for the opportunity. And hey. Thank you. Next time we're together, dinner's on us, okay? Oh, sounds like a winner. Yeah, we'll go down to Sam's Wholesale, and for $2.50, I'll buy you a hot dog and Coke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we love you guys. We love, we love seeing you. you. Too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody, for being with us, and have a wonderful evening. And until next time, okay? Good night, Happy everyone. Happy RV. Okay. Thank you now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.